Well, it's kind of like a big Thanksgiving dinner, right? You build it up. Oh my God, I can't wait. I can't wait to eat this. And then as soon as it's over, you're like, man, where'd the whole thing go? Training camp is over, Matt Bove. I can't believe it. And we've waited so long, had our dates circled, getting up there. We talked with, you know, Jenna and Mike and Dan about Rochester and all the great things to do. Uh -huh. It's over. Yeah, it happens fast. I mean, it's gotten so much shorter than it once was. Yeah. Training camp still goes on. It just moves back to Buffalo and feels more like a normal game week. Like after yeah. their preseason game on Saturday, they're practicing again a couple different times next week, one of which will be in Pittsburgh, but a couple different times in Orchard Park. So I guess that technically is still training camp. It's still considered training camp, but it feels like camp ends the minute we uh, take the sheets off the cots, pack up the pillows, you take the mini fridge, you take the Keurig, you pack up <laughs> yeah. the car and come back down the 90. They call it the race down the 90. Practice ended today, 11 o'clock. It's the Fisher 400 is what it is. Yeah, the Fisher 400. I love I love that. I haven't heard of Fisher 400. <laughs> Practice ended at 11 o'clock today. I do not want to say any names specifically because I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but there were players on that team back to Buffalo before 1 o'clock, I'm sure, <laughs> and practice ended at 11. So that lets you know you how the quickly math. they were getting the heck out of there. Yeah, you do the math for sure. Um, so they had, what, nine, ten practices, whatever, at St. John Fisher, somewhere around there. It was two weeks, a little over two weeks long. Now coming back to Buffalo, as you said. Let's get into some of our observations. We'll do that. But also mm -hmm. the news of the day, the last day of camp, coincides with the last practice really before their first preseason game. That's Saturday, 1 p.m. against the Chicago Bears. Sean McDermott said starters are going to play. They're going to play about a quarter. That includes Josh Allen. Um, look. I get Matt, I get, and I'm totally on board with put him in bubble wrap, put him on the sidelines, baseball cap. Do not see this guy at all. I also understand that Josh has a lot of different new parts on offense and the chemistry throwing in practice is way different than a game. I think this is a bit of a tough spot. Even if you're very staunch against guys playing, I understand if they didn't play them, that you have no risk whatsoever, but I understand Sean McDermott's point of probably wanting to get a little chemistry there. I understand it. I don't agree with it. That's how I feel. And just it's a very simple to me risk reward. I understand that it's important to get those reps and that there's a lot of new faces and that you want to see your quarterback out there. You give him a quarter, whatever it ends up being. I don't necessarily think that that equates to anything that continues into the regular season. I think you could have a really strong outing, a good quarter, and then you could come out of the gate flat or you don't play at all and you could come out of the gate swinging. What's interesting here is that you have in week one, two different approaches. So the bills are playing Josh on Saturday and yeah. who knows, maybe they play him again. The Cardinals are not playing Kyler Murray at all in the preseason. So we're going to see one quarterback who got snaps in the preseason, and we're going to see another quarterback who didn't get any snaps in the preseason. I just hate the idea of anybody getting injured in the preseason of significance. Yep. I hate the idea of an injury impacting your season before the season has actually even started. And I feel like the preseason opens that door, even though I know three-step drop, get rid of the ball, turn around, hand the ball off to James Cook, hand the ball off to Ray Davis. He's not going to be trying to extend plays and running down the field and doing anything like that. It's just avoiding a potential freak accident. Okay, I do think they're a bit, bit of a different spot. The Bills have one wide receiver in their entire team that has caught a pass from Josh Allen in a regular season game. Mm -hmm. The Arizona Cardinals are not like that. However, they do have a guy who's brand new, Marvin Harrison Jr.'s top five pick, and they have to have mm -hmm. some chemistry. I lean on the side you do. I'd rather not see Josh Allen. I don't think it translates necessarily. But again, I think that to get you know some reps in with guys against other people who are actually fighting for jobs can be valuable in the in in this scenario. Here's the here's the needle you have to thread though, which is even even by doing that, how much how elaborate are you going to get? Because like you said. Three step drops and getting it out really isn't chemistry. Three step drops and getting it out is just simply just playing pitch and catch. And I don't know how valuable that's going to be anyway. No, I get that. And that's the other thing. It's just like if you want him to actually build chemistry with these guys, 
then you need to go off script a little bit, or you need to have kind of a game plan. And I don't really think they're going to have much of either. I don't think they're going off script and I don't think they're putting in some big elaborate game plan for this game. I think it's Josh. Hey, try and throw a couple back shoulder balls to Keon Coleman. See if he can catch him. Let's have Curtis Samuel run some jet sweeps and some quick little out routes. And then you're going to hit him on these. And then we're going to call it a day. I said it on the last episode that we recorded. Just, I remember that year that they played against the Packers. Aaron Rodgers didn't play. Josh Allen did. They lit up the Packers for the few drives that they played. They went down the field. Gabe Davis had a touchdown. Bill's offense looked great. And then in the regular season, they started and they laid an egg against the Steelers at home. So I I know that that was with guys they already had. I just don't really think it matters that much because there isn't a really in detail game plan that's going to look anything like the bills are going to look. They're not going to do anything on Saturday that they're going to do in the regular season or not much of it. Anyway, I think the risk reward point is the right point that you opened up with. That's probably really where it lands for, you know, most fans. If something were to happen to Josh Allen, I mean, what did it, what did it matter that you're trying to get some chemistry, right? I think that's Mm -hmm. where you have to land on this. Um, But I do understand that, you know, the point of that. Now there are guys that, might play or might not play for other reasons. Even if the starters play now, like if Josh playing, you get the starting offensive line. That's going to happen. You're going to have them out there. You're going to get, you know, receivers are going to play in, in the regular season, mostly uh, starting receivers, basically. Mm-hmm. What about on the defensive side? I think the two names that people are really wondering about are Matt Milano and Von Miller. Uh, mm-hmm. You were out at practice on Thursday. I went up there and had to kind of shoot back to be on WGR. What did Sean McDermott have to say about Matt Milano and or Von Miller? Well, I didn't say anything specifically about either player but let's use tone, body language, and educated guesses. I'll be surprised if Matt Milano plays, just because I think that they are being overcautious with him, given the injury he's coming back from. As for Von Miller, he played a lot last year after coming back from injury. I talked to Von Miller after practice, and one of the questions he was asked was, do you think you're going to play on Saturday? He said, I'm a coach's dream. If they tell me to play, I'll play. If they tell me not to play, I'm not going to play. I'm just going to do whatever I'm told. I don't think a guy like that needs – I don't think a lot of the starters need to play. I especially don't think a Von Miller needs to play. I would give him snaps at some point. So if you want to get it out of the way now, maybe you just do it week one at home. But I don't know. I mean, Pittsburgh's grass. I'd rather get these snaps on grass than get them on turf. And I know that it's a little bit less of a controlled environment because it's on the road, but I don't think it changes that much. So I think we see Von Miller at some point. I think we see Matt Milano at some point. I don't think Milano is this week and Von Miller, I think is a coin flip. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. I don't, I'd be more surprised. We saw Milano at all in the preseason, just by even Sean, Mc, Sean McDermott's quotes, which are, which were basically like, you know, you treat, like he said something about an injury and taking a year recovery. He said, he's not, I'm not saying it's going to take him a full year, but he's on the pace. He should be. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's kind of saying, yeah, like he's, he's where he needs to be, which isn't playing in games right now until we need him to play in a regular season game. The other piece of news that came out on Thursday was Sean McDermott saying that Bobby Babbage is going to call the defense on Saturday. And then we'll see from there. You know me, Matt, we'll go back to March. I will tell you, I have said from March, I think Bobby Babbage is calling the defense in 2024. I not only haven't changed that stance, I'm more dug in on that stance after what we've seen in camp, what we've heard in camp, what we heard on Thursday. I mean, Bobby Babbage told us earlier in the week that he was going to be getting ready to go up to the box. Wasn't he in the box last year, though? I think he was as a position coach. Hmm. I think he was. That's a good point. I know Joe Brady was. I know Ken Dorsey was, obviously. I know that there have been guys who have done both. Leslie didn't, right? When Leslie was the defensive coordinator, I don't think he was up top. I think he was down low. Maybe not. I could be wrong. I, I, Someone had pointed out to me, and I'm like, you know, I think that's right. Either way, it's a good point. All of it, all encompassing, everything. Him saying that him calling it, him saying he wanted more call periods from Sean and asked to mm-hmm. do it a little bit more. Yeah. Sean, Sean's clue today. What did Sean say today? He said, I'm recording this on Thursday, by the way, when I say today, Sean said, listen, you know, I don't want to be over his shoulder all the time. He has to have that freedom and know that I trust him. Mm-hmm. I think there's just too many clues. that are saying Bobby Babbage is calling the defense this year. I just don't understand why they don't just, unless they're trying to give themselves an out, maybe Saturday right. is a disaster. Right. And uh-huh. I don't think it's going to happen at all. I think it would take, you know, something crazy to happen. But if Saturday is a disaster, maybe Sean doesn't want to paint himself into a corner. But come on, it, it's not going to be a disaster because you're not really doing anything in the preseason. Right. It's stop the other team. It's go try and score on the other team. 
So, yeah, I, I'm just still weirded out by why Sean isn't just announcing that this is going to be what happens. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, they've played this out this long. And, you know, even going way back a couple months ago, Sean said, that's just something we'll put in our back pocket and not even talk about. Well, he's still mm -hmm. not really talking about it. Although we keep getting more clues. We'll see. I think do, do think Bobby Babbage will call it. But I that's probably what it is, right? If something were to really happen. And, mm -hmm. Well, he could always say, well, I, it was always the plan anyway, even if it wasn't, because mm -hmm. that's kind of the way it worked out. All right. Training camp is wrapped up. The Bills coming back to Orchard Park for Saturday. Let's get into some of our observations throughout these last couple of weeks at St. John Fisher University. All right, we're done. 12 practices. You count the practice in Orchard Park as a practice of training camp. Do you say they had 12 practices or do you say they have 11 practices? I feel like I say 12 total. I think they did practice 12 times. I agree with that. So I actually had something over at WKBW.com talking about kind of my key takeaways from training camp. There's a lot of different ways we can go with this. But let me ask you this first. We'll paint this with a pretty broad brush, and then we'll start to get more detailed. The first question is, do you feel any different about the Bills than you did two and a half weeks ago when we first got to St. John Fisher? And that can be a specific thing, or that can be just in general. I do feel different in some respect. I don't in other respects. Here's what I mean. The broad view of the Bills, I don't feel much different. I've always felt they have Josh Allen. They're going to be fine. Um, they have a tough schedule. I think winning 10 games is a good season this year, meaning they can win 10. I'm mm -hmm. saying that if you get to 10, I think that's a pretty good job considering this schedule and all the turnover. I still think they're one of the better teams in the AFC, tough schedule. That has not changed for me. What's changed is what I think about some players and position groups, which is, okay, what's happening with Kyrie Elam here, but, you know, and, and him kind of pushing. It doesn't seem like he's going to start necessarily, but it's kind of changed that I think that he's, I didn't know if he would carry this over from what we saw mm -hmm. OTAs in minicamp. Um, wide receiver group it definitely has changed mm -hmm. with some of the names kind of trending up and some of the names trending down from what I thought. So that's, there's certain spots where I feel like I've, I've changed some stances, the broad 30,000 foot view. I'd have not changed on the Buffalo bills in 2024. My general sense is that I feel a little bit more optimistic about the defense in general than I did going into camp. I feel about the same about the offense and then there's actually like subplots to all of that. Offensively, I like the wide receivers more than I thought I would. Mm -hmm. Defensively, I actually like the safeties less than I thought I would. So even though I think the defense has had a better camp, I just maybe it's recency bias on my end, but I thought the defense had a really strong second half to training camp. It was not a dominant like the defense won every single day, but the defensive line and Taron Johnson and Roswell Douglas and both other corners, Kyrie Elam and Christian Benford, had really nice camps. Like one of the things that I put in my article was top performer, and I listed a couple of guys. Top performer does not equal MVP. The Bills' MVP is Josh Allen. It'll always be Josh Allen as long as he's here. But I thought the top performers at training camp were three guys on defense, Ed Oliver, Greg Rousseau, and Taron Johnson. Every single day, those guys made plays. The defensive line was so dominant at times at training camp. So that's why I feel like that's a group that could really be on the verge of something special. I also think it's just having Daquan Jones back. Having Daquan Jones back next to Ed Oliver lets Ed Oliver go from being a really, really good player to being a damn near dominant player. They can be really good up the middle in their front seven, right? Now, the back end, obviously, the safety concerns we can touch on, but... Mm -hmm. Boy, if Matt Milano really can come back to being Matt Milano or even any, anything a facsimile close to that, you think about what you just said, and then you pair that with Terrell Bernard and Matt Milano, and then Taron Johnson's in the middle, right? He's a slot player. I mean, they can be really, really dominant in the middle. And that is one thing I noticed this year, and I wrote about a couple of weeks ago, which is about a week ago. I've been very impressed with the first team run defense. Now, sometimes the offense gets a run here or there. It's always tough because there's no real tackling or mm -hmm. hitting involved necessarily. Second and third units, a little bit different. First team run defense, I thought was outstanding during camp. Swallowing it up every yep. time. I thought actually one of the players that left a lot to be desired during training camp was James Cook. Now, part of that is the ball security and the drop. Yes. But the other part of it is it felt like so many times he was getting swallowed up. Now, that could just be really good defense. Mm -hmm. The Bills defensive line, at least in a three of the four spots, should be really above average. The question is the edge rusher opposite Greg Rousseau and what they're going to do. But yeah, I think that that's a really good observation that you've had. I also today 
Today was more of a, when I say today, Thursday, like you mentioned, today was more of a walkthrough than it was an actual practice. But there were also some situational stuff that they were doing. And at one point, and this is not unique to just today, we've seen it at other times, but they had on the defensive line on a third and long situation, Von Miller and Smoot at their ends. They moved Greg Rousseau inside, not Smoot, alongside Ed Oliver. Like, if you're in a third and long situation and that's the defensive line you're going against, one of those guys is going to be able to get back there and either get to you or force you into making a bad throw. So they've got more versatility on the defensive line, both in the run game and in getting after the quarterback. Yeah, that's a good point. The number one question going into training camp in 2024 was most likely the wide receivers. Mm -hmm. Okay, did anything change for you up, down, whatever for the wide receivers? couple different players I think went up a couple different players I think went down the players who went up for me were Keon Coleman I feel like that's low-hanging fruit but I think Keon Coleman's going to make an impact more immediately than we originally perceived we thought he was going to be like okay he's going to be a big game big play guy might have some big catches every big highlight from training camp was Josh Allen to Keon Coleman <laughs> it's it just like, right can you like, like it, every, yeah. Everything that was viral on social media and that gets posted on X and all this stuff, it was Josh Allen to Keon Coleman. He made several big plays. I also think that when he's rolling out to his right, the signature Josh Allen play, if it's not Dalton Kincaid, he's now looking for Keon Coleman. Like I just get that sense that he's going to be the get-out-of-jail guy that Josh is going to lean on. So I feel better about Keon. I feel a little bit better about Khalil. And that's not that he did anything that was absolutely spectacular. He's just so consistent. He is mm -hmm. just such a consistent player. Feel about the same about Curtis Samuel. Think they're going to use him all over the place, but didn't feel, oh my God, he's been amazing, or oh, he's really struggled. And then Tyrell Shavers is the other one who is the definitely trending in the right direction. And today, Sean McDermott showed his hand a little bit when he was specifically asked if there are any players that have really stood out to him. And he gave the typical cliche, well, there's a lot of different players and I really like the competition. But after about a minute, he just got to Tyrell Shavers. That does not happen on accident. So I think those are the guys who have trended in the right direction. And then obviously the guys I didn't mention, not Matt Collins, he's the same too, but MVS, Chase Claypool, dip in a little bit. The one thing I'll say about MVS, I'm sorry, I'm rambling here. No, it's better, all right. better second half to camp than first half. Ended stronger than he started. Yep. So I still think he's going to be on the team. Agreed with that. Uh, as far as his better second half than first half, I'm not completely sold him being on the team, but I think they picked him up. They gave him a little bit of money. He's a veteran. I think they trust him more. He's got a little bit more runway here, right? To mm -hmm. For that to happen. So most likely he's, I'm, I'm a, I'm pretty there, but not totally. Chase Claypool's just obviously is unavailable right now. And mm -hmm. you can't, as the saying goes, you can't make the club from the tub. I mean, Sorry, but you got to be available. And it's unfortunately he's been hurt, mm -hmm. but he needs to get on the field soon. Uh -huh. um, Tyrell Shavers, arrow up completely, right? We, yeah. Everything you said is right about Tyrell Shavers. I want to have a little discussion about Keon Coleman in a minute because, um, you know, I think he's, he's a guy that everybody wants to know about. Another guy that started trending up for me lately is KJ Hamler. Lately, KJ Hamler, I think, has flashed a little bit and he is listed as the top punt and kick returner on their depth chart. If they feel KJ Hamler is going to be their top punt and kick returner, he's also going to get some looks on offense because he can do something no one else can do, and that's fly by everybody. Yeah. He's one of the ones who I think has had a strong second half to camp and a strong preseason would really get him in the conversation. I think it basically comes down to KJ Hamler or Daquan Hardy. And if they think that KJ Hamler can actually contribute, if it's close, I think you would lean Hamler. Oh, that's so tough, though, because you just drafted Daquan Hardy. The, the thing that's tough about that is that Daquan Hardy has actually had a pretty strong training camp defensively. So you can try and find a path for right. him, and it's like, okay, are you going to keep Taron Johnson, Cam Lewis, and Daquan Hardy as your undersized nickel corners who have versatility? Like Cam Lewis can play safety, and Daquan Hardy can actually play on the boundary a little bit too, which is interesting for his size. Or do you keep K.J. Hamler? I, I agree with you, though. I think K.J. Hamler has been utilized in this offense the way they kind of used Isaiah McKenzie for the last couple of years when he was here. 
I like that you brought up Daquan Hardy. He was one of my camp risers for sure. I'm impressed with this kid. Uh, he just seems like he kind of gets football, understands it, has an IQ that they trusted him to put him on the boundary a few times. And I will say, I think part of him being on the boundary was more for numbers because you have to get other guys in. To Corey Couch look good. Listen, Sean McDermott is known as like the DB whisperer, right? I mean, like that's yeah. what he does. He coaches these DBs. Matt, they might have found a couple of guys here. To Corey Couch is an undrafted rookie. Dude made plays like a, every day it seemed like something happened. You're like, oh, it's to Corey Couch. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. there's no chance. But I keep saying that. And yet here he is making another play. Daquan Hardy making plays. Daquan Hardy returning punts. I don't know how this is going to shake out. But one thing I'll tell you is, let's go back to the safety position. I said it was a little bit, you know, something that we needed to touch on. Cam Lewis is listed as a second string safety along with Cole Bishop. Damar Hamlin listed as a starter. Right now, Bishop and Edwards are hurt. Mike Edwards is listed on the depth chart with the third team. Is that just because he's injured? Because if that's what anybody thinks that's fine but then why is cole bishop listed with the second team does he have to make the team mike edwards does he absolutely have to be on this team no money wise he doesn't i was looking today like didn't give him a ton but man i just can't they signed him mcdermott said last week we signed him envisioning him to basically be the starter i don't i think it would be really really an upset if he wasn't on the team you signed him before Micah Hyde had any sort of inkling of what was going to happen with him. But if you get Micah on the phone, Micah Hyde's not coming back to you not keep, play. You keep coming back to Micah Hyde. It's not happening for quite a while if it happens at all. They you haven't given so? up. They haven't get. Isn't it interesting? Just for what it's worth, just reading between the lines here. Isn't it interesting? I've had this conversation with a couple of different people who cover the team that they haven't given out twenty three, the number twenty three. Yeah. I don't think it is. I think it's because you never know if he comes back, but it's not something that's happening until to me, at least like November. The thing I agree, I understand that point, but how much more bleak could the position look? Their second round draft pick is going to miss weeks. And they're a guy that they signed to be a starter has played like five practices the entire off season. And it's not like Taylor Rapp has been, Oh my gosh, he's been there. He's been fine. Like they, safety is the biggest issue on this team, mm-hmm. and you can make it not that big of an issue if you call Micah Hyde. In I your scenario, issues. though, in your scenario, you'd have to have Mike Edwards off the team and Micah Hyde like now. I just – I do we know Micah Hyde wants to come in right away right now? No, that, no, what this is, is all in Mike. What would be the money he would want? Uh-huh. And let's remember, if you're on the team as a vested veteran after week one, your salary is mm-hmm. guaranteed. I just don't think the Bills are interested in doing that right now. Yeah, that's the best point. Your point about that that you've brought up is the best point, that they wait, and then he gets back here week three or something, and then they start to acclimate him slowly back into this thing. I just, it is. Let me ask you this. I mean, you said it used a good word, bleak. How bleak is it? It's week to week for Bishop. It's week to week for Edwards. They have Taylor Rapp and knows the system. Damar Hamlin in his fourth year knows the system. Mm -hmm. Cam Lewis has a backup. How bleak is it right, right now? So here's my thing with this pretty bleak because we've always said safety is such an important position in a Sean McDermott defense. Mm -hmm. And right now they're not getting much out of the safety position. So to me, it's a pretty bleak situation because Cole Bishop, we didn't even think he was going to be a full-time starter anyway. And now he's got the injury. Mike Edwards, it's all communication to me. The other thing about Mike Edwards, he has played in Super Bowls and won one with Kansas City and won one with Tampa. But it's not like this has been a full-time starting guy who has a ton of experience. He's had moments, but it's not like this is uh, just different teams, Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde. And Taylor Rapp, somebody said in the comments, I read a lot of the comments. I probably read them more than I should. And they were like, Taylor Rapp won a Super Bowl with the Rams. Compared to me, you do, because I don't read any of them. I'm sorry, folks, but they just sometimes I just go crazy reading them. Somebody comments and they're like, how dare you like, be critical about Taylor Rapp. He won a Super Bowl with the Rams. He's a great player. And I'm like, I'm not knocking Taylor Rapp. They also let him leave after winning the Super Bowl with the Rams. So it's not like, you know, oh my gosh. So I I just think. How dare you be critical of Mike Edwards? He won two Super Bowls, one in Tampa, one in Kansas City, Matthew. It is far. It was the second biggest question going into training camp. Wide receiver was one. Safety was two. Wide receiver, some of my concerns have been alleviated a little bit there. Safety, the concerns are even bigger and greater than they were when training camp started two and a half weeks ago. Okay. I guess I'm not there yet because if I know that 
Edwards and or Bishop aren't playing week one, it's a little different. I think we're a long way from that. I mean, they're week to week and that could be a month into the mm-hmm. season, but they're out there doing their rehab, things like that. I just, I want to see how, where this goes before I kind of go down that road. I am concerned about the depth. It has been a concern all off season. I'm concerned about the depth at boundary corner, but Kyrie Lim kind of really helps that. And I think Jamarcus Ingram's had a good camp. I like him, yeah. you know that, but I think he's had a good camp as well. Let's uh, shift back focus. I want to want to touch on Keon Coleman and the camp that he's had here on It's Always Game Day Buffalo. Right, you said earlier, Keon, kind of a guy that, or a little riser because you think that he'll have mm-hmm. more of a role. Um, just overall his camp, you know, if someone said to you, boy, that kid, they took him, uh, they traded out of that spot. Kansas City took Xavier Worthy. Well, he better, he better, you know, show up week one. You know, what what is your concern level or your hype level for Keon Coleman, who someone, someone wants to talk about that? I like him. I like him. I think that he's going to contribute. I think he's going to be a big play guy. I think they're going to use him a lot in the red zone. He's just got a different skill set than any of the players they've had really in recent memory. I think he's going to be a stretch the field guy occasionally, but it's not just going to be that. I think he's somebody who can win at the point of attack. Obviously not the most fleet of foot player, but plays faster. It's all the stuff that everybody said about him when he got drafted has just kind of come into fruition, makes some great catches has to be he's on the same page as Josh Allen most of the time. I think he gets the offense well enough early on that when things break down, he knows where to go to always be following Josh. I mean, the the big play, the highlight of camp, the guys at cover one actually pointed this out with a screenshot, which I thought was a pretty good catch, where Josh rifled that ball across his body to Keon at the back of the end zone. I think it happened on Sunday. It was a Sunday practice. And Josh is throwing his finger backwards to basically like hey cut back like i'm gonna throw it that way and he was able to stop and then reposition his body josh throws it across his body on a rope and then keon's able to make the catch against really good coverage from benford so i am more optimistic about keon than i was at any point since he got drafted but i still think he is a young rookie who will have growing pains in this league, and there's a lot of targets to go around, and it's going to be, uh, I know their motto is everybody eats. I think most weeks there will be a different guy who's kind of leading the way as far as wide receiver is concerned, and then there's Dalton Kincaid, who I think will be the guy who gets most of the targets every week. Matt Beauvais and Keon Coleman right there. All right, tight ends. This is a really interesting position because I think we all agree that Dalton Kincaid is going to be a, a major focus and he's going to be, I think, a top level tight end in the NFL. I, whatever that means to you, he's just a guy that I think is really on an ascension and he's going to be thought of amongst the top tight ends in the league very shortly, probably this year. Dawson Knox to me is still going to be a very big part of this offense. I think they want to lean into a lot of 12 personnel. He's a very good all round player. They can use him in the red zone. He's a good blocker. Daw- Dawson Knox is a solid, solid tight end number two in the NFL. The Mm -hmm. guy that's getting a lot of run that we've talked about, Zach Davidson. I think he's on the team. I think Zach Davidson is making this team as the third tight end. The question for me comes in, do they actually keep four? Because A, we don't know what they're going to do with kickoffs and kick returns and the kind of guys you want, and Quentin Morris fits the role perfectly. Mm -hmm. And B, if you're going to lean a lot into 12 personnel, you might have to keep four tight ends on the roster because if one guy gets hurt, then you're down to Mm -hmm. just two guys on the team. Okay. This is complicated because I – tends to just naturally devalue special teams contribution. Mm -hmm. I just do, you know, maybe that's just from the outside looking in of covering the team. Everybody's like, Oh, he's a great special teams contributor. And I'm usually like, yeah, well the special teams hasn't been that good the last couple of years. So I don't really care. That's how I've said it on this podcast several times. When I tell peers and other people who I talk to that, I feel like Zach Davidson has a chance. It kind of gets brushed off. Like, no, he doesn't play special teams and he's not going to be on the field. Why are you going to keep somebody who's going to play three snaps a game, which because he catches the ball and get down the field, which is relevant. Like it's totally fair. I just really have a hard time seeing them keep four tight ends. It would be really surprising given the way that this roster is made up that they would keep four guys. So to me, it's just strictly, does he bring you that much more offensively than Quentin Morris and in camp? He has. For sure. But then the other counterpoint is you could get him to your practice squad. You could act like if Zach Davidson doesn't make the bills, he's going to be on the practice squad. I would be really surprised if he wasn't. I think Quentin Morris can too, though. I don't think I don't disagree. Uh, I don't I don't disagree. I know. All right. So so how do you separate the two then? 
How do you right? separate them? if you if you devalue special teams? Um, right now I would give them? right now I would give the edge to Davidson, but I think they give the edge to Morris. I think they give the edge to Davidson right now. I mean, like he's work in more it's good him. right <laughs> yeah it's 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 so hard because every day he makes a play yeah, and does. this isn't just a training camp this was during otas and yep. voluntary yep. workouts when he would catch a touchdown and then do a stupid celebration and then all of the offense would lose their minds and the only reason we even noticed it was because of the stupid celebration and then he just kept making big plays so you know josh allen's closing press conference he gets asked questions about zach davidson and he says he's making Brandon Bean's job really, really hard. Like, I think Josh is a little bit more in the loop than just making comments like that. I think he's got an idea what's going to happen here. So I would give the edge to Davidson, but I still think the Bills will give the edge to Morris. Any other positions or players that you just want to touch on before we wrap this site, this part of the uh, pot up? Um, you know, we got a couple questions about this, so let's just answer it as a okay. blanket, and then we'll specifically ask or answer some of the questions. Okay. Where are you on Tyler Bass? Um, so this is coming from a place of – I always try to remind people of this. Yes, I have my opinions, but I really try to give fans, when they ask questions, really an insight of what the team thinks about uh -huh. more than what I think. What I think doesn't matter. It's really what the Bills think about Tyler Bass that matters. I think the Bills – are in a position where they're not moving on from Tyler Bass. They made a financial commitment to him. He's made big kicks for them. He has a strong leg. He's young. And although he's been inconsistent and last year wasn't a good year and this training camp has been okay, not great. I just don't see a scenario where he's not the kicker in 2024. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I totally agree. I totally agree. It's just a question of the confidence level and Tyler Bass at the end of the game, you're down two. you sign up for a 48 yarder from Tyler Bass a year ago. I think most bills fans would have immediately done it. Now. I don't know how people feel about that. I mean, I think he's had a fine camp. I didn't think it was bad. I didn't think it was good. It's just, everybody notices the bad and that gets obviously blown out, not blown out of proportion. Cause it's a very legitimate concern. What was he? Six of eight on Wednesday. He missed two that yeah. were around 50 yards. He missed one in the stadium. That was so bad, such a bad miss. So I think those are the things that kind of float up to the top with him. I, but I will say I'm closer to one to 10, one being not at all concerned, 10 being very concerned. I'm at a six, yeah, maybe a six and a half. So I'm well, closer to that side. If anybody's wondering exactly what the money is, I have it for you. If the Bills okay. were to release Tyler Bass, mm -hmm. they literally save $100,000 and it costs 4.3 in dead money. It's just not happening, uh -huh. Matt. Yeah, for sure. I, I, he's not going anywhere now. I guess no. these questions about Tyler Bass are more of the future. Now, I, now, I, now, right now, now, yeah. Do I feel super comfortable with him trying out for a 48 yard as you put it? No, I don't right now. I think he has uh -huh. to, he has to bounce back in a big way. I, I also will tell you though, as much as they released Jack Browning, I don't think that Sam Martin's completely safe on this team. I think Sam Martin, if they, if the bills find someone on the waiver wire that they like better than Sam Martin, mm -hmm. I could see them grabbing that person. I mean, they brought Matt Hawk back for a couple of weeks. I know he met Martin was hurt, but then re-signed him to come mm -hmm. into camp. I, sure. I don't think that Sam Martin is complete lock on this team. It's most likely he's going to be the punter, mm -hmm. but they'll keep their eye open. Yeah. They'll keep their eye open for sure. I don't think that he'll get replaced, but I think that they are certainly mm -hmm. looking into things at every position, basically besides quarterback. What else you got? Any questions you said came your way? Yeah, well, we posted it late, and then we got just an absolute onslaught of questions. I, <laughs> I'm i going to start with this, this time one. of year. Yeah, I'm going to start with this one because I think they do some really good work. It's the guys over at Banged Up Bills, and yeah. they really provide a lot of insight. And he said he's gotten a lot of questions about this. Can you offer any insight as to why you think there may be more injuries, any different approaches to practices, temperature, more cautious approach due to the last two seasons? I think it's a fair question because the injuries have popped up a little bit for this team. Do you feel like there's a reason or do you think it is just a little bit of bad luck? I would actually like to see the data on more injuries than, than any other year. I feel like the injuries. It, I mean, go ahead. I think that we do this every year. Every year, like there's guys that have rest days. There's guy that, oh, he was a little tweak groin. He's this. Mm -hmm. I just feel like they play the long game in a lot of these guys. And, and 
the, the way I'm going to answer that is tell me what you mean first. Show me the data that there's actually more injuries because mm -hmm. none of these guys are super long term either. They're all just a little bit banged up. Um, I So I don't know the answer to that without actually knowing if it's true. What I was going to say, it's interesting you say that, my answer was going to be that I think the teams are even more cautious now yes. that these guys are not getting rushed back onto the field in the same right. way they once would have just because – you want to protect your – these guys are assets to these teams. You want to protect your assets at all cost. So I think these injuries that might linger a little bit longer than they have in the past are the own teams doing to make sure that these guys are not going back and retweaking things. I think that if it was up to Chase Claypool, Cole Bishop, Mike Edwards, like these guys would probably be trying to get on the field as soon as possible. But I think the team is the one that's kind of holding them back and protecting them from themselves. It does feel like, though, the last couple of years, there have been a lot of just weird, nagging training camp injuries. I don't know. Again, maybe I, mm -hmm. I'd have to go back last year and say, like, who missed, who didn't miss, right? And mm -hmm. how are you supposed to tell? A guy injures a toe, right? Chase Claypool. Did he stub his toe somewhere? Or was it something that had to do with football? I'm not really sure, right? I, it's just, yeah. it's hard. Bang, I agree. Banged up Bills does a really good job. They might have the data. Maybe there are more injuries. I'm not really uh -huh. sure about that, but I'd like to see exactly that being the case if that is something that's going to be asked. Uh, speaking of that, I have a question for you. Did you see that the Jets practiced in the rain on Thursday, but Aaron Rodgers was held out while everyone else practiced? No, I did not see that. Oh, it was it kind again. of a kind of a polarizing topic because Herm Edwards went on ESPN and said, "Well, last I checked, football players play football. You're paid to play football," which I think is a ridiculous take. Mm -hmm. I mean, guys get rest days all the time. Yeah. I am totally cool with Aaron Rodgers not practicing in the rain mm -hmm. on a on a wet field, even though everybody else did. He's a Hall of Famer who's thrown mm -hmm. thousands of passes, who's 40 years old, coming in off an Achilles. Maybe mm -hmm. you feel differently. Oh, I don't feel differently at all. It's the same way I said, reason I said, I don't think Von Miller needs to play in the preseason. Exactly. I mean, it's basically obviously different positions, different situations, but I mean, if you're going to the hall of fame, I don't think you need necessarily a practice or a preseason game to get yourself caught up to speed. So no, I don't think that that's crazy at all. There's so many questions here. Um, would you say this is the best group of guys Josh Allen has ever had around him on offense? I don't even think it's close. It, it, you could make the argument. It's the worst more than it's the best. Someone said the best and asked the best. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, at one point, no, I would not team, say they're the best at all. One team, this team had Stefan Diggs, Gabe Davis, Emmanuel Sanders, Cole Beasley, and John Brown. Like those guys were sick. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. It, 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 this is, that's definitely not. Maybe, um, maybe it's the yeah. entire scope. Maybe it's, well, you've got James Cook, who's a pro bowl running back. You have Dalton Kincaid, who's now, you know, emerging as this guy who we think is going to take the next level, but I still would take the other groups much more than I would take this group. Do you agree? You would take, say it one more time. I would take the 2020 and the 2021 skill position groups way more than I would take this this most oh my recent. gosh, yes. I mean, that group, and th this group is still TBD in a lot of ways, right? But mm -hmm. right now, initially, absolutely. Um, I got a couple here because I have to make corrections. Ryan asked and said, although we might, he might not make the initial 54-man roster. Ryan, it's a 53-man roster, just so you know. How has Gabe Stevenson, it's Gable, G he has said, yeah, but he said Gable, sorry. How has Gable Stevenson been progressing so far? And then we have Bill's Blitzkrieg. Said, I think a lot of us had a high hopes for S SVP, not Scott Van Pelt Blitzkrieg. It is, I think, <laughs> meant MVS. It's really funny though. So, well, thank you. Uh, what's the word could that be uh, the center, Cedric Van? Oh, Van okay, Grain? my fault. Bills Blitzkrieg. I owe you a huge apology because instead of yeah, you should have put SVPG right, Van Pran yeah. Ranger. SVP is Scott Van Pelt. So I was wrong. I got on you for being wrong. I thought you meant MVS. So let's take them to two of the guys in the middle, totally different uh -huh. circumstances. Uh -huh. Gable Stevenson and Cedric Van Pran Granger. Thank you, Blitz, Bills, Bit, Brits, Krieg. My apologies for that. Gable Stevenson won't make the team, will be on the practice squad, has flashed at times, is certainly a project. There are a lot of times when you notice that he is undersized, but there are also times when you're like, whoa, like that guy's an athlete because he is. He's got a gold medal. So to me, he has been exactly what you would expect from an unbelievable athlete who has never played football. There have been flashes, but it has not been a consistently noticeable thing. As for Cedric Van Pran Granger, SVPG, yes. he's going to be on the team. 
and he's going to probably be active on game days because they don't have a ton of depth from an interior slash center standpoint. Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know if I agree with that. I agree he's going to make the team. I don't know. He might be the ninth guy, and he's inactive on game day. you got to activate eight guys if you want to trigger that that extra mm-hmm. roster spot or two roster spots, I guess. But to me, you could have Deion Dawkins, Spencer Brown, Connor McGovern, Osiris Torrance, David Edwards. That's your starting five. Yeah. I think Ryan Vandermark's your swing tackle. I think Lyle Collins is actually a backup. I know we've talked about him a little bit. He's, started, mm-hmm. he's back now again. I think Alec and Anderson. Alec Anderson. And his, yeah. Alec Anderson is your backup interior and your extra lineman. And I think Will Clapp might beat out the extra center spot from Cedric Van Pran Granger, which allows Van Pran Granger to still be on the team and get work, mm-hmm. but not necessarily active. I can't say that I've noticed a ton of Will Clapp during training camp. So that's not a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just right, not right, right. paying a ton. So, like, I just haven't noticed him. So I can't confidently say that SVPG is better or a better fit than him. I just think that they would always tend to go with the younger guy who's still got the upside. Yep. And that, and that's totally fair. And that might happen uh, with them. All right. I got one here. This is from faith. I love this question, Matthew. What would your second career choice had been both of Hmm. us here? Had it not had this not worked out? Well, I don't even know if has this has worked out to be quite honest with you, Faith. But anyway, if you read the comments, Faith, I think there's a lot of people who think I should not be doing this at all. Oh, <laughs> they they let oh, me know yeah, about man. that every single day. Well, let's see, what would I be doing? Um, I always wanted to do something in sports. Uh-huh. I didn't like know I was going to do this. Some people, you know, feel say like, oh, I was I was bo- you know, this is my dream job. I was born to do this. I never really knew that this was going to be the way it worked out. I'm thrilled the way it has i'm so so fortunate i would love to do something in golf so i would say something in golf i not play golf i'm not good enough to do that but i love golf so to me a golf if pro we, like we're yeah. gonna you know golf shop be a golf pro not a pro you know what i mean by that like a yeah. pro at a golf course yeah it's it's way more detailed than this but my dad always said his dream job was to be like a golf course designer architect oh yeah and i think that that would be like the coolest job ever to like put my together. colleague at the BGR, Jeremy White, his college roommate is a was a was was is a golf course designer. Oh, no kidding. Really? Yes. That's really I cool. He, I, I believe he he was or he is still, I guess, maybe to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, I already had a second career and yeah. I was a teacher and a coach. I would probably be teaching and coaching. At one point in my life, I wanted to be a college football coach and I was pursuing that, you know, as a career. But I actually here's what happened, Matt. I know some people that coach college football and I'm like, I cannot live that life. They were literally living in like a different city every other year. It seemed like, and it was just not what I was interested in. And I love talking about sports, but you know, for me, um, I, I, I'm an entertainer camera talking. I was bored to talk. I'd be Mm -hmm. something in this. I'd be, I'd be an MC. I I always want to be a game show host, right? Something like that. Something where I'm, on a stage in front of a camera talking with people. I think coaching is a lot like that in a lot of ways, Mm -hmm. but to me, either educator or entertainer, one of those two. Did you know that not to veer back? Did you know that like one of the best golf course developers in the world is from Western New York, Mike Kaiser. Did you know that? So Mike Kaiser, I think his company is called dream golf, but right. have you ever heard of like band and dunes, band and trails, yes, like yes, those yes. courses, uh, Cabot cliffs out in Nova Scotia and others Cabot in Florida. And there's all these, like he is from East Aurora and is like a cabillionaire and made a ton of money in some industry and then got into golf course design. So, you know, there's always a Buffalo connection somewhere. I like that. All right. Do you have any other questions before I head on out of here? Anybody uh, that you're looking at specifically? Any questions that came your way? No, there was a lot of good questions. So we appreciate everybody who submitted something. Um, Okay. Let's close on this. All right. And I think that this is an important question to close on because I think you got a lot of attention. Somebody said, do you think the new vibe with the team is based off of coaching? Now, this is a really complicated and layered question because there's a lot that goes into it. This starts with Josh Allen being asked if he misses Stefan Diggs. And then that comment goes everywhere on social media and all the big networks it's being played. And I think Josh did a really good job of handling that question and gave a really good answer. Then you get him talking about how the vibe is different this year. And that's 
cliche. I've realized on the surface that is cliche because a lot of times that is said. So I posted that on Wednesday and it was polarizing. A lot of people were like, this is complete nonsense. And other people were like, well, addition by subtraction. I know what they're referring to. I'm not jumping to conclusions. So then today I talked to several players and said, are the vibes different? And do you have any way of like quantifying or explaining that? I got a good answer from Deion Dawkins. I got a couple of good answers. I think I asked Vaughn. I asked Kyrie Elam. I posted the Elam answer and he said, it feels like this season is a little bit less of a burden. I'm paraphrasing, but they're, they're just more free. Do you buy into any of this? Do you feel like the vibe at training camp with this team is different? And do you have any way of explaining that? I do. I do feel that way. Um, and I've said it and I've talked about it. Now, first of all, I want to tell you that I think Kyrie Elam could also just be coming from a place of personally for him because it is different for him. He's I did. Position coach. It was specifically about the team. And okay. he started the answer by saying, are you talking about the team? And I said, yes. Okay. Thank you for letting me know that. I didn't know that. I'll have to watch more of your stuff, I guess. I missed that today. <laughs> um, no, I thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, there's there's been this like underlying type of combustible pressure maybe over mm-hmm. the last year or so. I think a lot of it is because Stefan Diggs is that type of personality that, that can come from. It also can be really good for a team. So I don't want to make it sound like, oh my God, Stefan Diggs was bad for them. No, Stefan Diggs, I will tell you, Everybody in that building will tell you he made everyone better. Mm -hmm. He made the receiver room better. He made Josh Allen better because of how demanding he is and competitive he is. Rick Spielman on ESPN. I've talked with him on ESPN radio. He said the same thing. Yet he think he was the one that might even traded him to Buffalo. He said he's just so competitive. He makes everyone around him. But I also think there comes an edge and a kind of a pressure that comes with that. Mm -hmm. That maybe, yes, you love the competitiveness, but you have to also know how to take the edge off a little bit to allow guys to play free, mm-hmm. whether it's good or bad, whether it's translated. I don't know. I think a lot of this time we, we take something that happens. It's like conspiracy theory. You take something that happens then you go back and say, well, it's because of this, this, and this, when it really isn't correlated to be quite honest, mm-hmm. we might do that in this situation. I do feel the vibes are different. I do feel that they've intentionally kind of tried to create this. Yes. Hey, it's everybody, not one person. And mm-hmm. we're, we need to play more free without this underlying pressure. That's super combustible. Yeah. I think there's, you made a lot of very good points. I think the Stefan Diggs being absent is a factor, but it is not the only point to be yeah. made. I think the energy that is brought by the young coordinators who really resonate with their players has an impact here. I think that, the expectations that are altered a bit also is in play. I feel like this season is a little bit more like 2020 than it is like any of the last four seasons. We're going into it. The expectation is that this team is going to be good, but I don't think on the outside, the expectation is this team's a Super Bowl contender. Now you can just look at the Vegas odds. They're very much a Super Bowl contender. They've still got some of the best odds in the entire NFL, but the way people have talked about the division, the Bills love that. It's all we it's such an overused statement, but it is so much easier to be the hunter than the hunted. And for the last four years, this team has been the hunted at every chance that they can get. I think they're going to sneak up on some people this year, and I think they're playing more free because of that. And I also do think it's just really healthy to get new faces and new names and new guys on this team, because I think when you've got so many guys that have been through so much together, so much heartbreak and devastation it can have yeah. a toll on you. And I, I think yes, that, I yes. think that there was very calculated of let's yes. fix our salary cap, but let's also get younger and get guys who haven't been through this. Such a good point. You know, that team was that this team for a few years has kind of been unfortunately bonded by 13 seconds. Right. And I think that that's such a, you know, it's such a weight and toll on you. And now you don't, now you have a guy in MVS who's won Super Bowls. You have a guy, Mike Edwards, who's won Super Bowls. Right. And it's just, mm-hmm. I'm not saying that that's the end all be all or the fix all for anything like that, but I do think that there's something to be said for, unfortunately, maybe having to kind of start fresh and not have that same mindset that weighs on you all the time. Good job on that. I really like that a lot. It's a really good discussion. Um, the, not only hosts of it's always game day in Buffalo, but sports psychologists here, yeah. Matt Bovey and Sal. That's Capaccio. actually faith. That's what I would have done, right? I would there have been a you sports go. Psychologist. There you go. Hey, let me just give you a public service announcement from the Buffalo Bills because I was talking with Andy Major about this. You're going to the game on Saturday. Just want everybody to know um, because of the construction that's going on at the new stadium, everything like that. Abbott Road's going to close in front of the stadium at eight. Lots are going to open at nine. Gates are going to open at 11. Kickoff at one. But Matt, new this year, 
all the bills owned lots are permit only, no cash accepted. And if you don't have a permit, you got to figure out what you're doing to park. Cause when you get there, you're gonna be like, wait a minute, I can't park here. What are you talking about? And uh -huh. there are permits still available for single season games already. You can go to the bills website. You can find out about that. But if you're going to the game, just want everybody to know that. Also, if you're going to the game, Matthew, real quickly, you're going to see Caleb Williams make his professional debut, which is super cool. Super cool. You'll see Caleb Williams. You will see the return of Roma Tremaine Dunze. Edmonds, R Roma Dunze, former, yeah. future, never happened Bills wide receiver we thought might happen, Roma Dunze. Tremaine Edmonds, return to Buffalo. Ryan Bates, back in Buffalo. Ryan Poles, the general manager, I believe is from Canandaigua, so That's not right. far from Rochester. And yeah, I'm really, as far as preseason games are concerned, really excited because we get to see Caleb Williams and Josh Allen will also play. So that's more of a, can you fast forward through every time Josh Allen touches the ball and make sure that he's okay. And Caleb Williams, it's well, the same thing, obviously you don't want anybody to get hurt, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Let me ask you this to close out this episode of the podcast. So I'm superstitious, not crazy superstitious, but superstitious. So for every bills home game, for pretty much the last 10 years, I have listened to a playlist on the way to the game. Yeah. So just drive to the stadium playlist. I listen to the, basically the same music. Now I have added songs over the years, but some of them have always been on the playlist. I am thinking of drastically changing the playlist. Is that a bad idea? Like I I'm, not, you know what I mean? I'm just like, I it's a great to this. idea. Okay. So, you are transitioning like the Buffalo Bills have transitioned to something totally different, different vibes. Yeah. I mean, for me, it isn't necessarily correlated with the team having success. Now they have. Like when I started really listening to the playlist, the team kind of got good and then they've been good. For me, it's more of a, hey, you're fortunate to cover NFL games. You get to go to these games. You've yep. been doing this job that you'd love for a decade. Like, don't change the mojo. Just keep doing the same thing. Like the same song always starts, but I want to change it a little bit with the way my music taste has changed. Some songs that mean more to me now than they once did. So like, I, I want to adjust it, but I don't want to screw up the mojo of covering NFL games. I don't think you'll screw up the mojo. You're covering NFL games because you are who you are and you're good at it. And you're going to well, keep doing that for a long time. The playlist, though, needs to change up a little bit because it's a new season with a new team. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. I'm going to have Dad love to ACDC. So yes. Hell's, Hell's Bells was one of his oh, songs. Um, as so as, I think, as you get in the car, you pull out of your driveway, the first bell tolls, you're ready to so, rock and roll. So, yeah, I think that's going to be very prominently placed on the playlist because, you know, just a little ode to him and just think about him on the way. So And that song it. slaps. So <laughs> that too. It I love that. All right. Matt Bove, WKBW TV Channel 7, Sal Capaccio, WGR Sports Radio 550. Thank you very much to Mike Robbie, our producer. We will talk to you this weekend at some point after the Bills' first preseason game against the Chicago Bears.